Hi, my name is Amar Malik. I'm a senior research scientist at Aid Data, which is a research lab at William and Mary here in Virginia. What is the Belt and Road Initiative or BRI and what were its original goals? Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is the Chinese government's flagship global infrastructure, connectivity, and development financing initiative. Uh, it was announced back in 2013 when President Xi uh, had first started uh, his first term as president. Um, Ten years out, the BRI has obviously evolved a lot, but the original intent was to make sure that there are these five connectivities uh, coming back into China. In fact, it was known in English as One Belt, One Road, uh, meaning that we, China will create different types of connectivities with uh, Global South partners, uh, including physical connectivity, uh, fiber optic uh, or technology connectivity, uh, cultural connectivity, uh, sea, maritime connectivity, and so on. Um, so that was really China's uh, way of saying that we have a lot of excess capital and we would like to use it to meet the infrastructure needs of our partner countries in, in the global south uh, and therefore form connectivity between China and our partners. Are there any criticisms of the BRI which have been addressed and which still need to be addressed by China? Uh, yes, of course. Since uh, the Belt and Road took shape, there have been many different types of criticisms and the pace at which this criticism has come out has uh, uh, been rising, uh, even though um, it started in the Trump administration years and um, during the Biden years, uh, it has gone up even more, both from the US government, but also from the media. Um, if you pick up any newspaper um, in any given month, you will see stories that talk about two or three types of criticisms coming out of the Belt and Road. The first, perhaps most popular narrative is around the debt distress that Belt and Road has created. Part of that, the narrative is that China has uh, deliberately trapped these countries into the so-called debt traps uh, and therefore, they're using this as leverage to get concessions uh, from developing countries. Um, the second criticism is that Belt and Road projects are not done to the highest quality standards or highest standards of protection uh, for the environment, uh, for social and labor consideration, and they do not follow the highest standards of governance. Therefore, they end up being uh, corrupt uh, and promote corruption and malpractices in the construction of these projects. So those two criticisms have been um, coming out uh, from all over the world. And we have seen mixed results, um, both on the positive and the negative side, as far as projects are concerned. Uh, I would give the example of uh, Pakistan, um, where the energy sector has received some $20 billion worth of Chinese investments through what is known as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is considered as the flagship of the Belt and Road Initiative, the first big project that they introduced. Um, the challenge that we are seeing in that case is that while Chinese um, agencies, uh, banks, and official creditors were able to provide record number of uh, investments in Pakistan, uh, and very quickly, uh, Chinese state-owned companies were able to uh, increase power production capacity to levels never seen before in Pakistan. Therefore, between 2013 and 2017, the power shortages in the country were completely eliminated. Um, but six years on, the challenge that Pakistan is facing uh, is inherent to Pakistan's own uh, independent power producer policy, where the government of Pakistan is liable to repay um, these loans in dollars, um, whereas uh, it sells electricity to the people of Pakistan in Pakistani rupees. Well, in the last uh, two years alone, the Pakistani currency has lost a lot of value to the US dollar. Uh, and because the Pakistani economy hasn't grown up, people's income levels have been flat. It is incredibly difficult for the government to recover um, these, um, uh, you know, the, the, or generate these revenues uh, 
to repay Chinese loans. Uh, and for that reason, uh, Pakistan is uh, now uh, stuck in a, uh, a balloon of uh, debt or a ballooning, an unsustainable debt trajectory uh, where the state is essentially subsidizing power to the producers to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars every month. And that has generated uh, immense problems uh, for the Pakistani um, economy and uh, for the stability of its power system. What are the successes of the BRI for China so far? Um, I think uh, by uh, by spending something like $1 trillion, it is estimated the size of the BRI, China has really augmented it was as its position as the champion of the global south as the leading country in the developing world and it is projecting an image of uh, the provider of not just money but also technical support and um, ability to uh, invest in infrastructure such that uh, millions of people would come out of poverty. Uh, so this so-called China model is uh, taking shape in the hearts and minds of uh, developing country elites all over the world. And I think that uh, through this strategy, China has also solidified its soft power position, uh, both in terms of media coverage, um, but also public support for its leadership and for its position. Um, and I think that that uh, for a great power like China, who is emerging now and trying to take on the, the world order as it sees uh, it to be unfair, essentially, since they were not at the table when uh, these rules uh, were, 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 were made uh, after the Second World War, they see this initiative as a very important part of China's story to the world. Uh, basically to say that we can help you build yourself out of poverty and uh, lack of development. Just follow our lead and work with us and we'll show you how it's done. What can we expect from the Belt and Road Initiative in the next decade? When we look at the future of the Belt and Road Initiative, the popular narrative around the world now is that the BRI has slowed down. Some analysts have gone as far as to say that China's own economic problems at home um, mean that the BRI is all but dead uh, or that it has completely come to a standstill. Um, and of course, COVID hasn't helped in the implementation of these big infrastructure projects uh, as well. Uh, my view is slightly different. I think that the main driver of BRI has been a geostrategic calculation on the part of uh, Chinese thinkers and policymakers, and it is also driven by huge volumes of foreign exchange reserves that China has been holding uh, for many years. Uh, even now, China's foreign exchange reserves are in excess of $3 trillion. And of course, they're always looking for more bankable projects around the world where they could invest that money and get returns without destabilizing its own economy at home. Uh, because of those factors, I do think that uh, the BRI will continue, has continued, uh, and we will continue to see new big projects being implemented around the world. Now, however, it is also true that uh, on, the supply, on the demand side, where uh, we look at the debt situation around the world, the IMF numbers indicate that uh, the proportion of developing countries who suffer from debt distress has essentially doubled in the last decade. Uh, this means that countries are far less able to receive uh, these big ticket infrastructure projects and then to repay them on time. Um, and so we think that it's going to be a, a, a slow moving progress, but I don't see the BRI stopping uh, anytime soon.